From Luminary, this is Therapy versus the World. I'm your host, Joe Nucci. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, and together, with the help of our very special guests, we are going to arm you with mental health knowledge that will help you tackle the emotionally difficult aspects of your lives. We will break down pop psychology terms and constructs like narcissism, trauma, self-esteem, relationships, and more. Hopefully, you will leave each episode understanding yourself and others a little bit better. For those of you that don't know, Gen Z and mental health are really overlap topics. Some studies show that over 40% of people who are in Gen Z have a diagnosable mental health condition, and it is the Gen Z interest in mental health on Instagram and TikTok that has made mental health a cultural conversation and has blown up many influencers' platforms, including my own, due to their interest in mental health. A lot of people have a lot of questions about Gen Z and mental health, like how much social media really has got to do with it, or how much of this happens in every young generation, and we just have a different perspective on it now because so much of it is readily available on these platforms. Today's guest is Zach Gottlieb. Zach is the founder of Talks with Zach, a Gen Z global wellness platform. I first encountered Zach in an op-ed where he talked about what Gen Z gets wrong about mental health. I then found out that we're actually both mental health champions with the Mental Health Coalition, a nonprofit that brings together different creators and artists and influencers who talk about mental health and wellness. Welcome, Zach. I'm very excited to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for a conversation. For those of you, um, for the listeners who are not familiar with you, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your backstory, what it was kind of like for you getting into everything that you're doing now. I started Talk with Zach two and a half years ago, and it started as we were coming out of COVID, and the media was encouraging teenagers like me to talk about emotional health and our well being and what we were going through. And I kind of noticed that none of us could do this. There's so much stigma around wellness, and I really noticed that it was a challenge for me and a lot of my friends to speak about what we were going through and what our experiences are like and our feelings. So I wanted to create a space where we could have authentic conversations and really bring to light everything that my generation deals with and show people that they're not alone and also educate them to become more emotionally fluent. For someone who doesn't know anything, maybe they don't have any younger siblings or any family members that are in Gen Z, what do you think makes Gen Z as it relates to mental health? What do you think makes your situation unique? You said that it wasn't possible and you're helping making it possible. Um, prove it to me. Like, ha- like, what do you mean by it's not possible? Well, first of all, I think in every generation, it's hard to be vulnerable, especially as a guy. Um, And I think for us, it's particularly challenging to speak out and talk about our emotions and feelings. I feel like now, luckily, um, it's becoming easier, but we still have a long way to go, especially for younger guys and guys growing up nowadays. I also feel like social media is a big factor because on social media, there's so much pressure to put out a certain persona that's very curated and isn't vulnerable and isn't all of your moments, but only the moments you select people to actually see. And I feel like we've adopted that into our own lives and we start practicing the same, which is we're curating our lives and the moments we want to share with others. I think that it's um, for a lot of people from, so so I'm I'm a millennial and I think from the outside generation, it's really easy to point to social media as like, this is the thing that's messing everything up for that generation. And I'm curious if you agree with that and if you think there's any other factors at play for young people. Well, first of all, there are things I love about social media and I seriously don't know what my life would be like without it just because there's so much, um, so there's a lot going on there socially that wouldn't be possible without it that I'm really grateful for. That being said, like I said, it's not all great. Um, and, and, and I think we all know this. And I know a lot of um, people in other generations that didn't grow up with it tell us your phones are the problem, social media is the problem. And my response to that is it's a problem. It's a big one. But um, I think you really have to understand why it's the problem. And for me, a lot of this comes from, first of all, the comparison aspect because um Mm. when you see people post um all these things whether it's related to like their bodies or um 
things they're showing off or places they're going and experiences they're having. And I feel like whatever it is, when you just see a lot of people doing really cool things and really interesting things and looking great all the time, you might start to wonder, well, why am I not like this? Why is why am I not always looking perfect? Why am I not always going on these really cool um, adventures or experiences, places or trips or whatever it may be? So I feel like that's a big aspect of it. And another thing is um, when you open social media, you see what other people are doing. You see what your friends are doing. You see what you're not invited to. You see what you're missing out on. And even though a lot of the time I'm like, I don't mind because I'm like, yeah, like there are things that I won't invite everyone to if I'm just hanging out with a smaller group of friends. There's still something like, hmm, you kind of wonder. And I I know a lot of people kind of feel the same way, which is that you kind of get this uh, this like fear of missing out, this FOMO, when you see all these other people having fun a lot of the time. But like I said, you're not taking a picture when you're alone doing your homework on a Friday night. Right. One thing that I've been curious about, and I would love to know what you think, is it's been very interesting for me as a practicing clinician to see not just the destigmatization of mental health, but in some ways, like the popularization of it. There are some creators and influencers who simply just kind of record their struggles. And sometimes the videos I see can be, um, they're almost kind of humorous, you know, someone with um, ADHD or maybe, you know, Tourette's and it's almost a little quirky. But then other times it's like people crying you know, on camera and it can be very, very intense. And I, I sometimes wonder, so when I was younger, um, when I was in high school and social media first started coming out, something that everyone did on like Facebook, because Facebook was, I think the main one before Instagram was the pictures from the party you would upload. It's like people would, it would be like the wrong angle or like if you were in college and you were drinking, it would be like a very silly drunk picture. Like those are the things that would get a lot of likes and engagement. Mm -hmm. And now it's, I, it kind of seems like there's been this shift where it's like, well, now you would never post a photo of yourself that wasn't filtered from the right angle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder First, so my first question is one, did you, do you experience social media? Like I just described Facebook, like, has that been an experience of yours? And two, do you think that maybe one of the reasons why mental illness has become such a, or mental health has become such a topic on social media is because it's something that feels real. It doesn't feel like performative and like overly positive. So to answer your first question, yeah, of course, social media is very curated and very done up nowadays that's just how it is i know when people post on a more private social media page or a private story and yeah it's going to be a little bit more raw but when mm. you see something public that's something that's a picture that has been taken multiple times or a video yeah. that's been shot a couple times right so that's that's my answer to that question and then i do think though because i have seen these videos where people are crying or they're getting really emotional and intense about something. I just think people want to see themselves. They want to see their stories. They want to see their struggles. And when you see something so relatable or you see someone making fun of that and making fun of themselves, you kind of see yourself in that. And that feels really mm -hmm. good to see yourself. Yeah. No, I mean, being reflected, feeling validated, seen, yeah. known, understood, it's it's not just something that I think is a truism in therapy, but I think in media, in relationship, in conversation, it's a really, really core human need. And so it makes sense that as this culture, if you will, of um, people kind of overly curating things um, become so not just so normative, but really so powerful and influential that there will kind of be this other side of it. Like people want to see the, the mess, the negative side, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. They, they, they want both. And I think why some of these vulnerable things go really viral, these, these videos or these pictures is again, because we have a craving for that raw emotion because we see it so little. Mm, you see it so little, um, mm -hmm. like in life on social media, both, both, both. Yeah. You only really see people break down or, you know, um, you get get really emotional with you if it's your best friends, but you never really see that in strangers. And when you do, and when you feel like it's a similar experience, again, when you 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 see someone similar to you, you feel validated. And when you see it going viral, you're like, wow, so many other people are validating what I'm feeling too. 
Yeah. Something that happened for me when I started making content and I would see some posts do really well and some posts not do so well is there's actually something kind of vulnerable about putting yourself out there, particularly as a content creator, not just on like a personal page. Cause you're kind of saying like, Hey internet, like, do you like this? Like, does this resonate? You know? And it's kind of, it can be kind of intimidating. I think. When I, when I was first posting on social media, I was very worried just because I've seen not only what friends would say, but also what strangers say on social media, because I know, um, as a guy putting myself out there, yeah, a couple of friends like were kind of cracking jokes at the start, but um, now they're on board with it, which is which is important, <laughs> which is a good thing. But um, I was I was mainly just worried, like, what what would some stranger say? What would some random person on the internet say yeah. about me? And even still, like, of course, I'll see someone, and maybe it's not even related to my content, but it's like related to me. You know, you see negative comments all the time, and I think just saying like one or two definitely gets to you. And while part of me was worried about putting myself out there as a guy, the other part is like, I just know what the internet is like. And people are so quick to be judgmental and so easy for them to hide behind a screen, hiding behind a profile that's not theirs, a name that's not theirs. Yeah. And it allows people to say things they'd never say in person. Mm. So in, it, it brings up a couple of different things for me. The first thing I want to ask you about, you mentioned particularly as a guy, and you just mentioned it mm -hmm. again. Um, do you think that the way you describe Gen Z's uh, conception of masculinity doesn't sound that different from my generations or like the generations before? Um, and so I would just love to hear just kind of, I mean, any immediate thoughts or reflections about that and whether or not you think it's changing or what role social media plays or conversations around mental health play in that? I've noticed the world's gotten very polarized and I'd say a lot of people are going back to this more antiquated traditional view of masculinity and are really obsessed with that and are advocating for this very, you know, stereotypical male, don't be vulnerable, push everything down. Um, mm. Instead, go to the gym because going going to the gym is the only thing that'll that'll help you with your emotions which i know working out like first hand i know working out and things like that are great for my mental health but they're not the sole factor in um uh giving me balance and in, in, in my life and i'd say the other mm -hmm. half is the, kind of the opposite of this like guys be vulnerable guys should you know speak out try to go against mm -hmm. the norm but i see so much it's really like either or and when you see so many people kind of clashing on this, like what's the right view of masculinity. I'm really hoping it could shift and, and, and it could really be a combination because I do think there's, um, there's some strength in each. And if they work together, these two views, I think that could be really powerful because there's something nice about um, valuing like strength and really working on yourself. And that's aligns with the more antiquated view, but at the same time, I think how that's actually done is problematic. I really, really like what you said about how there's value in both, um, because I think that I think that when people start absorbing mental health content, or they start going to therapy, and they start developing um, an awareness for these concepts and a vocabulary for these things, it can very easily quickly become, you know, feeling your feelings is good, expressing them is good. And if you do these things, you will be mentally healthy. And I think that that idea comes from kind of this like old school um, Freudian psychoanalysis, where it's like, there's mm -hmm. something repressed about your emotions. And if you just experience catharsis, you will get better. And that is certainly true some of the time. Some people need to come to therapy and learn to feel and express and emote and have a catharsis, and that can mm -hmm. bring about a lot of symptom relief. But psychoanalysis is just, or that type of therapy is just one style of therapy, and it's one style of healing. And the best way I ever heard it explained was when you're, when you're a mental health clinician, it's not so much that you're just performing analysis or you're just trying to feel feelings for the sake of it. You're actually more acting as an engineer. So if you're 
house's electricity wasn't working or the plumbing wasn't working and I were to come in, I would have to kind of rearrange things in order to make the system work in an optimal way. When someone comes to see me for therapy, sometimes, yes, we actually need to do exactly what I just said, which is you need to learn how to identify feelings and feel them and be vulnerable. But then other people come to therapy and they're crying in the first session and their feelings are actually really overwhelming and they're really, really intense and they're actually dysfunctional in the sense that they're not getting certain social, occupational needs or obligations met. And so when that happens, it's actually like, yeah, like, you know, have you been going to the gym? Like, do you have other outlets? Like, how is your sleep? Um, I have yet to have someone come into my practice who is um, really proud of their nutrition, sleep and exercise routine. Um, typically <laughs> that does help. And to your point, it's only one part of the story because I've also treated people with some pretty severe mental illnesses. And if you just told them, well, did you try going to the gym? That would actually be incredibly ignorant, actually, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways at the same time. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting take. And I'm curious to hear more about um, like so, like some of the things your your patients are coming in and like really wanting from you. And because I feel like when people think of therapy, they think of either let me solve my problems or let me unload, um, just like kind of like rant and unload whatever it is on my mind. And I'm really curious how, how you redirect people. Yeah. Well, the first, the first thing I would say is that it actually, I believe in a private practice setting like I work in, it actually mm -hmm. starts with the marketing. And so okay. this may not surprise you since I know you're familiar with my content, but I kind of brand myself in the marketing as a little bit more of like a tough love therapist. It's like, I mm -hmm. tell people, it's like, I'm going to be direct with you, yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm, and I'm very humorous and it's like, I'm going to crack jokes with you and I'm going to, we're going to get into this together and like wrestle with whatever is going on with you. And the people who reach out to me nine times out of 10 will say like, I messaged you because I didn't like the non-directive approach or I felt like my other therapist treated me like I was too fragile or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people forget that, you know, private practice is a business. Therapy is a business, even if it's kind of a, a nonprofit or a community um, psychotherapy center where you're, um, you know, giving free therapy away. It's still being run as an organization. And so I think that that's probably the first part of kind of like directing people. But once I have someone, they may think that they want a directness. <laughs> and, I, and then I kind of give them some direct feedback and it's it's too much. Maybe they get overwhelmed or maybe they, they shut down or they start rationalizing away. And so then it's my job to assess, okay, where are they at in what we call the stages of change? Um, are you familiar with this? Like the kind no. of pre-contemplation, contemplation. So if you if you Google the stages of change model, there's two parts of the stage change process. One is pre-contemplation and one is contemplation. In pre-contemplation, you're not necessarily um, aware that a change needs to be made. You may be aware that there's a problem, but you don't necessarily know like what the change would be. In contemplation, you're actually aware of that change. And I think about these two stages of change a lot as a psychotherapist, because what I often find is that people come into therapy and they kind of have one foot in one and one foot in the other. Like they have this, um, cause it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it is humorous, but it's also very serious. It's like, well, what's worse, not having self-awareness or having enough self-awareness to know you're sort of contributing to the problem, but not enough self-awareness to know like what you're doing or how you're doing it. Um, and I think that that can be a really tricky position to be in. And it really comes down to the patient's personality. And this is where therapy becomes less of a science and more of like an art. And it comes down to, well, is this someone who's going to benefit from that tough love approach like I talked about? Um, I treat a lot of men, a lot of guys, and a, a lot of guys actually want someone to be like, you know, a little bit more direct. I mean, I have have said verbatim, like, I think you are completely full of shit. <laughs> and like, I don't think you believe anything you just said. Like, do we want to rewind and try it again? And so there's not a lot go. of, it, totally. But then some people, like, I would, I would never talk to them like that. That's yeah, not their yeah, personality. Yeah. That's not what they requested. And it's a little bit more like, and anyone who's been in therapy has probably heard this one, but it's a little more something like, I'm not attached to what I'm about to say, but do you think it could possibly have to do with X, Y, and Z? But like, I'm really not sure. Like, I'm, I'm more curious to what, to what you think, <laughs> you know, and that's the more kind of gentle, but also direct 
approach. Um, and then it can even be less direct where it's like, I'm not even saying, do you think it could be this? I'm more just kind of reflecting little bits at a time and, and seeing if they'll put it together. Um, it's all, it's all, and that's one of the things I really like about therapy. It's, it is, it is a craft much like the law or medicine. You can have all the knowledge that doesn't make you any good at applying it to a certain situation. I love that. I think, I think that's really great. And it's an interesting thing for me to think about too, what you're talking about, if I'm like aware of what I'm doing, um, or not and, and how to move forward. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things I wanted to go back to is, um, Mm -hmm. you were saying that, you know, social media is part of it, but it's, there's a lot of really, really great things about it as well. Um, are you familiar with the psychologist? Her name's, um, I believe it's Dr. Jean Twenge. Um, she wrote this book called iGen. Yes. Yeah, I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know that, um, one of the things that she has talked about is she talks a lot about social media, but she also says there's also these other trends kind of happening for your generation. One of them is that you're more likely to live at home for longer. Um, there's a lot more permission to kind of go about your career in a different way because the economy is different than it was for your parents' generation in which you kind of, you know, got your nine to five and kind of climbed that ladder. That's not really how it works anymore. I'm curious, and it doesn't necessarily have to be with anything she's talked about, but I'm curious what you think the other factors might be in terms of how someone who's a millennial or someone who's older grew up compared to how you grew up or are growing up. I definitely have noticed that I think that people see so many different ways to be successful now. And I think that's a great thing. I do. I think it's great that people are taking more non-traditional paths and still becoming really successful and doing what they love. I think that's amazing. I, what I do think though about this is related to social media, which is that I feel like people are very comfortable now having relationships online and what i mean by that is even if like you know the person um especially like whether you're friends or if you're if it's like something romantic when you're texting or snapchatting or you know like dming on instagram whatever it is um i think many times it promotes a false sense of intimacy and Mm. i know that for me when i used to snap people on snapchat so i'll just explain really fast I, i mean are you familiar with how snapchat works I am. I When it okay. first came on the scene, I used it, but I, okay. I, I don't anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I but explain it for anyone who's not sure, familiar. Sure, sure, sure. So it's, it's an app. Well, the, the big catch of it is you could send pictures. You communicate through pictures. Um, and you can send a picture, usually of yourself, uh, to someone else. And then if you send a picture of yourself and someone else sends a picture back to you, there's this thing called a streak, and it increases by one every day that you send a picture mm-hmm. back and forth. So I think that's like one way they hook you. But for me in my experience, it's like if I'm ever starting to like talk to someone or like starting to like date someone um, before we'd start snapping or start like talking online. And at first I'm like, wow, this is like great to like kind of get to know someone. But what I've learned now is it promotes a sense of false intimacy. Mm. And it takes away a lot of what you learn about someone in person. There's no spontaneity. There's none of that. And there's not a lot of emotion. And what it does is it serves as this thing that's in lieu of that. So people feel like, okay, I don't have to actually meet this person. You can kind of have this online relationship first. Um, and, and I think with friends too, like I, I know that now what's great about not using Snapchat is that, this is just one example of social media. I know I know people that love using it and use it in a way that works for them, but I'm just kind of taking a break because I like talking to people. I like texting them or calling them, but um, I just find that these more fulfilling modes of communication work better for me. I really am inspired and curious about this idea of social mm. media and false intimacy. Um, and kind of like this, this idea of, I, it was a meme, I believe I saw, and it said something like, ladies, that man that replies to every single one of your Instagram stories, 
maybe he doesn't like you. Maybe he has a crippling addiction to his phone. Mm. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. And obviously, you know, their social media addiction or phone addiction is, is, a, is a different rabbit hole we could dive down. But yeah. I've had those thoughts. I'm like, oh, this person watches my story a lot or this person replies mm-hmm. to the stuff I post. Do they want to be friends with me? Do they want to go on a date with me? Whatever it might be. But that's there's actually no proof of that because are they doing that to everyone? <laughs> Were they doom scrolling before bed? Were they yeah, exactly. you know, just wanted to be distracted at work? You don't know. <laughs> the other thing to think about too is now it's been normalized is just talking to so many people. So it's like maybe, yeah, they, they are kind of interested in you, but they're also interested in seven other people. Yeah. <laughs> and I know I know that I'm I'm guilty of this and I, I used to kind of do that where I'd talk to multiple people just because everyone was doing it, but what I learned from that is when you're in a relationship with someone, you're only talking to one person. So for me, it seems a little foolish to do something that's not like what it's going to be like when you're actually dating. Because the whole point of talking to someone and initially hanging out is to see if you're romantically compatible. And when you're talking yeah. to multiple people, or when I was at least, it just felt like this doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. It's, it's not, it's not going to work in my favor. Um, and unless you just want to do something casual. Yeah. And to your point about false intimacy, mm-hmm. if you're talking to multiple people, even if you have intimacy with each of them and you're genuinely interested in each of them, the intimacy, the level of intimacy is going to be limited in a sense, because yeah. when you're all in for one person, that's a very different kind of risk and vulnerability where it's like, I'm all in with three people. You know? Yeah. Um, it really is. And I remember for me, when I was talking to multiple people at one turn, I was like, I always want to be talking to at least like, like have like one girl that I'm talking to generally. It was really unhealthy because I kind of didn't see the line between I am genuinely interested in this person and I want to talk to someone because I like talking to people. And I feel like one thing that I've noticed in people and myself as well is you shouldn't be doing anything like romantic if you're not totally fine being alone and being single and not talking to anyone Mm. at the moment. One of the things that our conversation has me talking about is a lot of what Gen Z is dealing with, at least according to you, in terms of social media, intimacy, dating, all this stuff. I'm actually not hearing a huge difference between what you're dealing with and what I'm dealing with as someone who's almost 30 years old, you know, living in New York city and is squarely a millennial, you know? Um, and it just kind of has me thinking, I'm wondering if in some ways Gen Z has been the, um, what do they call it? Been the scapegoat for a lot of the Mm. cultural problems and difficulties we're facing. And I'm, I'm curious what, what you think about that. All generations at this point, I'd say up to a certain point are, are dealing with very similar things. And I think, if you look at previous generations, it's always the similar topics just presented in a, in a different way. I'm talking mm-hmm. about relationships here or, you know, anxiety or pressure. That's always been around. It just looks different because the world is different in 2024 than it was in, mm-hmm. you know, 1924. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> or even you 20 brought up, years ago. <laughs> you brought up Snapchat earlier and... Mm-hmm. We kind of discussed it in terms of false intimacy and and dating, but I'm wondering if there's also a darker side to it. Um, I'm actually thinking about bullying when I was mm-hmm. younger, and I know that um, when I was in high school and middle school, MySpace was a thing, and there was this like this thing called Top Friends. Are you familiar with it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Snapchat and so the idea is the best friends list. So ex- I imagine exactly. Yeah. So the um, if so, if I'm not mistaken, the Snapchat best friends um, has to do with how often you're sending snaps. It's kind of yes. gamified in a way. Yep. MySpace best friends was actually you ranked and ordered like your top eight oh. or your top twenty. Wow! And it was it was just, it was it was very very different. And there was a lot of oh my emotional God. pressure that came with mm-hmm. that. Um, and I'm wondering, I cannot if- imagine that happening <laughs> like that. that. That would break me. Wow! Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I think it did break some people, or it was just interesting. I know that I had this experience of thinking that I was, you know, 
I'm really close with like a dude in my grade or whatever. And then it's like, I'm not anywhere on his top 20. Top 20. I mean, there were, there were only That's like, you know, there was only, or there's only like <laughs> 50 kids in our grade or whatever it was. <laughs> oh. Wow. You know? Wow. Yeah. yeah, it is tough. And I know I got Snapchat a little late. I was kind of late to social media in general because my mom was a little protective of me uh, for well, in middle school. I didn't get my first phone until COVID happened in 2020. And then I didn't get Snapchat until I think 2021. So about like three years ago. So how and old were you when you first got this technology? I think I was 15. Okay. Yeah, 15. I was 15. And when I got it, I remember um, I had a friend who was like kind of talking with this girl, kind of flirting and whatever like first high school ro- romance, um, you want to you want a picture. But anyway, what was really important to him was if both of you are each other's number one friend on Snapchat, a yellow heart appears. Maybe it's a different color heart now, but at the time it was a yellow heart. And that yellow heart was the most sacred thing. I mean, oh my God, it was crazy. And and just the just the pressure to have a yellow heart on a, on a on a little app on your phone to, to signal that you two are close. I and mean, that's like, it's laughable for me. And I remember once he was like, ah, what if I, what if I play hard to get? And I remember what he did was he sent me like, he just snapped me like, I think like 40 or 50 pictures in like in 10 minutes. So I would like move up on his list and the heart would get removed <laughs> to like make her jealous or something. And I'm like, it's so funny to me. The lengths people would go and okay, like, first of all, this was years ago and everyone was kind of immature, but it's just like, that's what social media does to you. It makes you do things like that. When I think about it, it's just really funny. The reason I ended up, uh, one of the reasons I, I stopped using Snapchat and not to diss it because I did enjoy it for a while and it is a good app for some people, but I remember my mom's like, Zach, so this is the app where you send a picture of your face to people and i'm like when she said that it just i'm like i don't want to take ownership that that's something i regularly do because it just sounded <laughs> sounded kind of dumb it's like yeah i said yes i sent a picture of my face to a bunch of people and they sent a picture of, of their face or or their wall back to me you know because like sometimes they'll just like you send a picture to a lot of people people are shy they'll send a picture of like their room or something it's it's just like the concept when you talk it out is really funny um and i think that in in addition to like maybe i should prioritize my actual relationships than sending pictures of my myself and and getting them back from other people and i think that's what really led me to be like okay i'm gonna be really intentional not only to take a break from social media but also work on my in-person relationships because that's not something a lot of people um are doing and it's not something i was doing enough yeah. how are you doing that i you, you mentioned you're not on snapchat anymore but what are other um, practices or intentional things you're doing with um friendships or romantic relationships or with family yeah. you brought up your mom how is it different now what what has worked for you <laughs> yeah uh well obviously i'm not snapchatting my mom or you know my my grandma who i'm also close with <laughs> so well well, I mean, that would be a pretty cool mom and grandma that, if they were on really the Snap funny. game. You know, I think, <laughs> I genuinely think my grandma would really enjoy Snapchat. It just seems, <laughs> I think she'd, she'd really enjoy it. She'd love the filters. But my grandma and I will go out to dinner. She'll tell me really interesting stories from her childhood because um, she was a very interesting person back then. And she has a lot, lot to say about that. So it's really fun hearing about that. I feel like the more in-person things you do, the better. So like with friends, like I'll just talk to them, like want to like do things, want to hang out, want to talk, want to connect, that kind of thing. And also I really like talking to new people. And a lot of the times that will start on social media, but I think um, it's nice if we're actually like talking about things and having conversations, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And also like going up to people, like if I see someone and I like in public and I like their shoes or if I like something they're wearing or if, you know, whatever, just like go up and talk to people or if we're at the same, mm-hmm. like if we're at a party, like just go, just go up and talk to people. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
I'm a very, very extroverted person and mm-hmm. I have noticed, and I don't know if it's social media or just, um, you know, the world can feel very anxious right now or, or what it is, but I've, I have noticed that sometimes I go up to someone, maybe it's, you know, at a, at a party or in a bar or wherever I am and I go up and I'm, and I'm chatting with them and it's, it's not even that they don't appreciate that someone came up to them, but it almost feels novel where they're kind mm-hmm. of like, oh, wait a minute, you know, and there's, and there's always this, um, moment of awkwardness that I have to suffer through. And sometimes mm-hmm. they don't want to talk to me and that's totally fine. You know, that happens to everybody, but then other times it it just takes them a second. You know what I mean? And yeah. I, I wonder if you experience that too. You do have to be persistent. I've, yeah. I've noticed that. I know sometimes when people would just spontaneously come up to me, I'd be like, huh? Because it just doesn't happen <laughs> a lot. But I definitely know that the last few times I've like, gone up to people wherever I am and just just like start talking about things it doesn't have to be the standard like so what's your name where are you from what what's you um I know like a lot of people like the joke is people at colleges it's like what's your name what do you major in like where are you from like just like (laughs) a three questions and it's like just talk about anything like just like go up and be like so like if you see something um like if they're wearing something that you like I I remember I went up to someone Sky, this really cool jacket. I'm into like vintage clothes and you have this jacket. And we just started talking about that. And I didn't know Sky's name until like five minutes in. And it was it was just really cool to just like talk to someone and meet like someone that's cool um, and just chat. So, so I feel like if you just start talking and don't worry about information you should find it, find out or the questions you should be asking, that's really helped me just go up to more people, whether it's at a networking thing or just meeting people or wherever, honestly. Yeah. It's, um, I do remember that from college. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, what's your dorm? What's your major? Yeah, Where are you exactly. from? It's the, um, the default smooth <laughs> questions, you know? And then I feel like, you know, at least my experience of my twenties has been, you know, it's like, what do you do? You know, like what neighborhood <laughs> do you live in? In, in New York city, um, mm-hmm. particularly it's kind of like, you know, what section of Manhattan or Brooklyn or, or Jersey are you in? And, um, I know that at a certain point, this was years ago, I was getting very tired of the, what do you do? Cause, and other people would as well. They were, it just feels so transactional and, and mm-hmm. networky and, and not, and, and not like you're actually interested in them. You know, yeah. it's like, it's cause the, the parenthetical question behind it is something like, what can you do for me? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, like we don't work in the same industry, like nice talking to you, you know, and then you mm-hmm. go talk to someone else. And so what I started, it's, it was a very simple change, but I started to say, do you like what you do? Do you enjoy it? And it was so interesting because some people would immediately come out and just be like, oh, God, no, but it, you know, it pays really well. Or like, or mm-hmm. like, actually, I feel so lucky. Like, I freaking love what I do. And yeah. you know, it was just, it was, it was a, a simple way to go about it. And so, um, cause I've seen on some of your content, a lot of it's been focused on like college applications and yeah. decisions and going to college next year. It could be interesting um, to twist it. And instead of saying, what's your major? It's like, do you like your major? Like, why mm-hmm. did you pick your major? You know, when I start asking people why questions where I'm like, why this, why do you like this? What do you like about it? Those lead to deep conversations. Whereas the, what doesn't really do as much for me. And I think if you could just ask why five times to one thing, it's a lot. I, I learn a lot more about someone if I ask why to one thing several times than if I'm like, what this, what that, what the other thing. Mm. I'd rather just learn more about how they think and what they think about yeah. things. And and that's really interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. It makes me think of a class I took in graduate school. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was just, it was like counseling skills or, or something like that. And they actually cautioned against using why. And mm. the reason they cautioned against it is because they said, when you ask somebody why, the answer they give you is kind of like, if you were to divide a pie into a hundred little slices, it's kind of like one of those slices is, is a why question. Because there's so many reasons why. There mm-hmm. always are. And so they said, if you want to really get to know your client or your patient from a psychotherapeutic perspective, at least, ask how. Mm. So instead of why did you pick your major, it's, how did you come to pick that major? Because mm-hmm. then it starts to become like a, almost a developmental history. It's like, well, mm-hmm. I took this class with this professor and read this book and then I was really inspired and then X, Y, Z. And so I'm not story. saying it's a whole story. And, yeah. and I'm not saying that it's bad to ask why. I mean, I use why in my personal life. I use it with my patients as well, but it's it's kind of a different uh, cut 
if you will, in terms of getting to know someone? That's really interesting. I've never really thought of that. But I guess it it, it forces you when you ask how. It's, it kind of, for me, when I heard that, I was like, if someone asked me how, like how, like how I got here, why, or like how I'm doing what I'm doing now, it's a story. It's a, this thing led to this thing led to the other thing. Whereas the why is like, well, let me give you like five different reasons or mm. somewhat related. So, so that's yeah. interesting. I think I'm going to start using that. Yeah. And non, totally. well, obviously <laughs> non, non, uh, therapeutically, but, uh, <laughs> You know, more and more socially. But yes, I will be using that. Yes, no, no, most definitely, most definitely. I'd love to touch as we're getting towards the end here. Mm-hmm. Um, what is something that you and I are working on right now as it relates to some of the topics we thought about today? And I'm wondering if any of the knowledge we recap today can get us present to how to go about meeting those goals that we've set for ourselves. So for me, one of the things that I'm being very intentional about in terms of friendship and dating and all of the Mm -hmm. above is to resist the temptation to play the game of it. And Mm -hmm. when people talk about game playing, they often think there's some sort of malicious intent. But as you pointed out earlier, a lot of our communications, whether it's on Snapchat or Instagram or how we text, it's implicitly gamified. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is to not think like, oh, I shouldn't text this person back because they haven't gotten back to a couple of my texts. You know, I I should be able to take a hint, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Something I'm really trying to step into in the new year is actually say, if there's real intimacy here as opposed to the false intimacy we brought up earlier, are they going to care that I double mm-hmm. texted them or triple texted them or whatever it is? And can I trust that they will make it clear? If, maybe not in a direct or mean way, but in a kind way, if they're not interested. And so that's something that I've been working on. Some of the things we talked about today in terms of this distinction around false intimacy or how sometimes we're just Mm -hmm. using these ways of communication in a completely unintentional, unconscious way. And it actually, you shouldn't necessarily interpret the person liking your story or Hmm. replying or not replying. Because I don't know about anybody else listening, but I'm completely overwhelmed by the amount of notifications I get. If I don't get back to one of my loved ones or a fellow content creator, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just just trying to stay above water, you know? So true. I, I love that so much. Because not only is a lot of our social interaction gamified, but a lot of it too, um, and I think social media is responsible for this, we're both consciously and subconsciously thinking about how do I, like, what, what do I need to do psychologically to get this person to like me, whether it's a friendship or a romantic thing. And I know I, know I saw this, this uh, video and it's like, why do people, when I send them a text, why do they wait like, two minutes or like seven minutes before applying. Like, I, I, I know you're <laughs> on your phone. Why don't you just reply? And it's true. It's like, I know sometimes there have been times where like, yes, I've genuinely been busy, but other times where I'm like, wow, like I'm on my phone now, but they literally texted me right now. I'm not going to reply right away because that's weird. But um, I think going into the, going into this new year, I'm just going to reply. And if it's two minutes after they send a message or two hours, it doesn't really matter. There's no way. I remember once I saw this video, there's this rule that's like, you know, if you're texting a girl, what you do is you double her response times. And I'm like, (laughs) if you can't get someone to like you for being you and you have to play games with them to get them to like you, that is going to be a horrible relationship. Yeah. It is. So so I just love that you bring this up. It's also... So the reason why a pickup artist from a psychological perspective might give that advice is because they're actually not trying to cultivate intimacy. They're trying to cultivate desire. And those are two different constructs. Both are important in a relationship, and it's not that they both can't coexist. Um, I think it was the psychologist, um, Esther Perel, in her TED Talk, her phrasing is, fire needs air. In order for for there to be desire, put a little space and actually strategically introduce that. And her specialty is um, maintaining eroticism in, in long dis- in long-term relationships. Excuse me. And that is okay to do. But I think the issue with what 
that advice that you saw, which is double the wait times. It's if you're trying to make someone hot and bothered for you or start wondering like, oh, do they not, you know, like I mean, if you're trying to increase that desire, okay. But if you're trying to develop an intimate relationship with someone, to your point, that's probably not the best way to go about it, you know? Exactly. Food for thought. What What's something that you're working on um, mm. that you wouldn't mind sharing, um, particularly as it maybe relates to some of the topics today? If, is there any kind of knowledge that we um, you either learned or we just kind of recapped? And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna set an intention around that. What might it yeah. be? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think I'm gonna steal yours. But in addition to that, yeah. um, I don't think everyone should should practice what you just said because that's that's so important. But I think just uh, putting myself out there a little more in the sense that now that I have some more freedom, I'm the second semester senior in high school now, and now that I have some more freedom to really do the things I want to do and really just put myself out there socially and do whatever, I think the more I take risks and say yes to things, I just want to do that, especially now, especially Mm -hmm. as I'm like kind of past the college admissions process, which is stressful for so many people and it's really been holding me back but i feel like at this point i finally have some time to just go out and do things and i and i really just want to do that and um like we said i think um talking to people going up to people that's really important and not being afraid of whatever response i get even if it's a little awkward at first yeah most definitely. And that'll be really good practice for college, Yeah, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll have to have you back maybe later in the year to talk about that transition. It's something that yeah. a lot of people go to and it can be really, it can be exciting, but can also be difficult, um, not just for the um, person going to college, but for the whole family. You yeah. know, it's, it's, a, it's a transition period. Is that already started to kind of come up for you? Are there any foreshadowings of that or is it still <laughs> too far away? I think it's a little far away, especially because, um, you know, I still don't know exactly where I'm going. But right. I think the other thing is it's, uh, at least how I view the year, it's like the, the summer kind of feels so far away from now because it's like, okay, the school year, I still have the school year, then I have the summer, and then I go – to college so it's a little far away now i think it's really going to hit me when school ends and close to to around the time in like you know may when i graduate um but right now i'm kind of just focused on where i am now in high school i'm really excited for college i've been away from home before and i i love it i don't know what i'm gonna how i'm gonna react to adjusting to a completely new place and being home being away from home for a very long period of time but we'll, we'll have to um talk about it then but i'm i'm really excited i think i'm gonna love it and yeah i'm stoked i'm <laughs> i'm excited for you um it's i mean the adventure of life unfolds mm-hmm. in sometimes really unpredictable ways i know for me so i also grew up in california um, uh-huh. and i'm an east coast convert now and if you had asked me my senior year of high school i always said i want to go get experience a different culture meet different kinds of people and then i want to come back because i was like i'm a i'm a california boy and now i can't really imagine going back i love being on the east coast and i'm, I'm converted they got me and so <laughs> you just never know what will happen as we wrap up two things the first thing is what what kind of call to empowerment do you have um, for people who are listening to this around mental health? It could be related to something we talked about today um, or just anything else that you talk about in in your content. If they can only think of a few things or remember a few things, what do you think is important? I know something that both your and my missions really share is that message of empowerment and that Mm -hmm. it'll get better. It'll be okay. I'm going to take that one step further, which is that in the moment, a lot of the time, whatever you're dealing with can feel like everything and it can feel like you're going through it alone or you're never going to get through it. I guarantee you it passes and you might laugh about it one day. It's happened to me numerous times where I've like, I'm not going to like, wow, I was really caught up in that thing that didn't matter at all. And so many of the things that I have thought mattered or mattered in my life or even even in the college admissions process, which I know is like not really not um, a good analogy to like mental health, but I know so many times in life I'll think things matter and they don't. Same thing with the college admissions process. Same thing with a lot of mm. my relationships or emotions. So it's going to be okay. Take a step back and know you're not alone. Yeah. 
What's so beautiful about that message is that it's not just true, it is also evidence-based. Mm -hmm. Emotions are temporary. Yeah. And it's something I talk about in my content a lot. It's something I talk to my patients about a lot. And it's so, one of the cooler things about psychology and why it's my favorite subject and why I love being a therapist is I understand that. I understand that from my professional experience and from the research on it, et cetera. But when I'm feeling an unpleasant emotion, man, it sure doesn't feel like it's going to be temporary. You know what I mean? Like you really feel that urgency to act oh, or to make yeah. it go away. And one of the few things I might say about being a quote unquote well-adjusted person or a mentally healthy person is, is the continual practice of that. You know, you don't have to act on every emotion that you feel. And in fact, arguably you shouldn't. <laughs> no, exactly. So, yeah. But it's okay to feel it. It is. And it's so, really nice to just sit with it and yeah, be okay and express with it. feeling them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Zach, as we wrap up here, how can people find you? How can they support you with what you're doing, with talks with Zach, if they're interested in your writing? Um, how can people yeah. get a hold of you? So you could find my website, which is talkwithzach.org. If you go search that up, you can find my Instagram there. Um, you can see my conversations. I have a blog feature. You could ask me questions. You could partner with me. That's, that's the main, that's like the central point for, for where I am. If you want to see any of my articles, I mean, I've, I've been published in the New York Times, the Atlantic, most recently the LA Times. You could just go on any of those sites and search up my name, Zach Gottlieb, and you'll see my stuff. Awesome. Well, Zach, it has been such a great conversation. Like I said, we definitely have to have you again. And for those of you who are listening, we're going to take some of these clips. We're going to put them on our social media. Feel free to ask us questions that will inform our next conversation. And please definitely come and like our page on YouTube. And on Spotify for the podcast, that's one of the easiest ways to support us. And remember, Therapy versus the World episodes are available early and ad-free when you subscribe to Luminary. Thanks so much, Zach. Thank you.